What's the point of nostalgia? Hell if I know, but returning to a game is always an enticing offer. You remember all the good times. Fun bosses and mastering the controls to the point where, hey, you could be a glitchless percent speedrunner. But you go back after 15 years and sometimes you can better see reality for what it is. If anything, Sunshine was my real introduction to Mario. I'd played World at a cousin's house a few times, but it never enticed me quite like the 3D Marios. Probably because back then, that's what I played most since getting an N64 and a PlayStation 1, with the Genesis being a hazy memory even back then. So who wouldn't want to return to a series entangled in their formative years when it's being strangled held as such a limited release meant to induce buyer fear of missing out. So I went online, pre-ordered, got it a day early, and now I apparently own a single level world record in Sunshine? Perhaps by this point you're waiting for an opinion on whether or not the collection warrants its poor handling via some harsh words, but that conversation's long past its relevancy. Most have already given in to such tactics not once, but twice before, even buying an SNES ROM on a Wii disc. Some are just slow slaves to a brand and nostalgia. Perhaps for some, it's miraculous that Nintendo put in the effort to craft an in-house emulator for these games and update them with cleaner textures, when most remasters or retexture projects, despite great care and effort, have a tendency to prefer noisy details over clarity, often damaging the art direction. At the end of the day, 64 is the same game I didn't finish all those years ago. Same frustrating camera, slippery controls, and truly a great game in its own right that the series still builds itself off. I won't deny there's great details to be found here like how Mario's hat gets blown off and stays off till you retrieve it, or how levels are hidden in some fun ways that can only be found via experimenting or pure chance, but its form of level design has only really been iterated upon in Sunshine and Odyssey, yet the freeform nature of 64 is ultimately what kept me valuing its design over the other two. If you don't like shifting Sandland's overly punishing quicksand working in tandem with Mario's tendency to slip great lengths at the lightest contact, contact of a slope no problem, you can avoid it entirely. Or if you're a master of Mario's moveset and Big Boo's haunt isn't quite up to your standards, that's okay too, there's more challenging routes to be taken as well, so you're always able to play closer to your skill level. But it still allows those easier and harder difficulties to remain for players looking towards 100% completion. This would all mean nothing of course if players lack the ability to collect most stars within another's challenge. Play Lethal Lava Land and nothing's going to stop you from from collecting a hundred coins, defeating the bullies, or entering its volcano. Whether this is to save cartridge space by only crafting a single scene iteration or not, I can't say, but it shows a lot of attention and care to keep those things built into the general level design. While some stages offer ways to circumvent this like shortcuts, those like Hazy Maze Cave don't, while others might lock them behind items like the wing cap. If there's one thing this freeform structure has going against it, it's probably repetition, as non-100 coin stars kick Mario back to the hub world, meaning the player has to restart the entire level. And often the difference between doing one star and another ends up being a minor difference in what direction you're going, potentially leading to two different star challenges being made up of 80% the same content. It's underwhelming to say the least in that regard, but I also think it's somewhat beneficial in that it does allow you to find later stage stars ahead of time and plan out how you'll want to tackle those next, making that run more of a challenge in speed and efficiency. Whether you perceive that as circumventing wasting time or not is up to you, but this freeform nature does have one negative in that it can easily distort the general difficulty curve. If you get the 70 stars necessary to unlock the final stage through Tiny Huge Island and its more simplistic platforming challenges, it's going to seem more like a massive spike in difficulty. If you get them on TikTok Clock or Rainbow Ride, it's going to seem on par if not easier. It's a relative concept and the payoff for beating Bowser itself might become relatively relatively better or worse depending on who you are. And while optional challenges allow for more leeway with later difficulties, it's just a design choice that's difficult to accommodate for. Yet 64 pulls it off mostly well in that some stages house secondary sections that, like Bowser stages, are based off a more linear course challenge like those of 2D Mario, which tend to be more objective based like its standard stages, which help push the player's platforming knowledge in a linear direction through two different styles of level design. 
Still, there's something to be said about the general spiral-like level design most stages find themselves occupying. Since players are guaranteed to always start at a stage's ground level, you're immediately acclimated to any potential dangers. bob on Battlefield's biggest hurdle is just a flat ground level. No damage or immediate consequences befall you other than fall damage for more extreme heights. But it never costs you any lives. And if you ever miss a red or yellow coin, it's an easy drop back down to find one. Of course, it's not long before the game starts throwing sand, fire, and cold water your way for slow burn damage, slow movement, or high rebound and damage effects, before it caps off by making pitfalls the immediate danger. Knowing there's a pit and instant death for one wrong move is always going to be more intimidating than having to go back up a few safe walkways, because given enough repetition, a greater punishment awaits in backtracking. Whether you think lives are an outdated concept, there's still a lot to be said about how they influence your decisions mid-gameplay, so there's a greater emphasis on learning Mario's controls and learning to better exploit them, for which a great deal of the stages are built to accommodate, while some others tend to flounder to account for it with random guest chests. There are exceptions to this general freeform level design, mind you. Koopa the Quick and most of Big Boo's are essentially isolated encounters with only a single star, but this is still generally applicable logic. So much so, I question how a younger me was able to discern certain star locations. Mario 64 is a game so ingrained within gaming culture and more niche subsets that it's likely for my younger self and newer players that some hidden stars are no longer self-discovered, but absorbed through the media they consume. That's at least a memory of knowledge I can recall when I first entered Shifting Sandland. In a way, one of Sunshine's greatest strengths is in how it abandons 64's freeform star collecting aspect for a more linear but defined challenge. Go in for a red coin run and some degree of the stage design is altered, with nothing else to get in the way or distract you from that challenge, but at the same time the player's ability to only work with the content they enjoy is diminished. As the first seven levels of any world are mandatory to reach the final boss, while each one is locked behind another. It is important to remember Sunshine came out at a time when stories were becoming more prevalent within games, and it's not hard to see the effects it has had on this game. But rarely does this newfound linearity aid the game's story or level structure in any way. At best it just means you fight a harder version of a previous boss, but these elements are just pebbles upon the game's already rushed development. In an odd choice to meet the game's arbitrary quota of 120 shines, it ends up introducing blue coins which annoyingly ask if you want to save upon each one's acquisition, a great degree of which are hidden behind graffiti, some of which are gained instantly, but others of which require a small dash to require, and I remember these being quite problematic for me as a kid, but not even a challenge as an adult often acting as a straight line with little to no opposition. Some seem to even replace shines once found in properly developed challenges, suggesting that perhaps the freeform nature was once planned before being ultimately scrapped, making them disappointing by comparison when you realize you went through more hassle than the stage's actual shine challenge for only a tenth of one, losing the same satisfaction and relief 64 had for its optional challenges. It's apparent that the stage designers weren't able to properly accommodate for blue Coin's existence while designing them, due to them being a late stage edition, or so I assume. Pina Park is the easiest example in that it was clearly designed as a point of interest first and later repurposed into a level to pad the game out. None of its inherent geometry lends itself to platforming challenges, blue coin collection, so it ends up using easy to instantiate and modify generic steel cages to circumvent stage design issues, even spreading them across multitudes of other stages and are only made more frequent the later a stage is intended to be encountered. It was probably the best they could do given a year to wrap up its development as it allows for easier design iteration, but once you realize this it does take you out of that game's world design a bit, especially when only one of these cage segments makes use of the Flood. This modular design is the one aspect it shares with the Floodless levels which highlights Mario's somewhat weaker movement and in one egregious instance heavily exploit mechanics devoid from Mario's base movement with high punishment. I think what they both share more than anything is the disappointing reality of how underutilized the flood is within later stages, as graffiti becomes less involved in actual stage objectives and the challenges become more gimmicky. Not to say bloopers can't be excused when 64 had races on slides, just that these don't play into Mario's base movement as well. Had there been races incorporating the alternative boost nozzle, this could have been made more engaging as an experience, as could some of the other bosses. They might not be inherently better, but they would have given the flood more value as a mechanic. But a go 
goes mostly ignored even within optional shines, either due to time constraints or poor lack of planning. It's a shame when Il Piantissimo might have posed more interesting challenges had he himself further incentivized the Flood's use, perhaps even using one of his own to further push the player's knowledge of the Flood. But as it is now, Flood's use towards faster movement seems to diminish with each new race against him. Perhaps removing the Flood from some of these made them easier to iterate upon as the devs could concentrate on Mario's base movement rather than those with the Flood, and probably why the devs equate its removal with crafting harder stages, but it severely undermines the game's core draw, highlighted more so when those floodless challenges are rendered pointless by the Flood's post-game return. Ultimately, the rocket nozzle is the only outright mandatory upgrade in unlocking an extra stage and the final boss. Had they had enough time for both, we probably would have seen much larger stages as the current ones we do have rarely have the size to accommodate for Mario's enhanced movement with the Flood. Instead, the cut corners and excessive padding are self-evident. Carrying fruit 10 feet to a basket or Yoshi is filler content at best, but having two red coin challenges per stage screams of lacking content. This diminishing stage quality perhaps wouldn't be as egregious though if it weren't for Sunshine's numerous glitches that can easily rob players of safety or victory. But I think one mixed aspect is the switch to digital triggers. Splitting Flood between two buttons is a great choice, it offers more control, but it does somewhat diminish his originally intended mechanics. It could have gone a little bit more smoothly for me. But I think the one controller change that surprised me more than anything else was those found in Galaxies, as the cursors now being dictated by gyro controls. Pointer controls from the Wii may not be insanely precise, but they have an incredibly defined positional range, so over time players can easily guess where their cursor will land based on their hand rotation and position. Meaning there's an easily defined center, making it probably the closest consoles had come to mouse-like controls at the time without actually having to use one. Gyro controls don't have a defined boundary or second point of reference to define its center, so it's unsurprising that the game uses R to reset its position even if it leads to unintended exploits. And I guess you can touch the screen if you're playing in handheld mode. However, the results do largely keep things flowing smoothly. I'd be lying if I didn't say I was surprised at how efficiently I was able to control the cursor even for some more spectacle-based events than grabbing star bits. Of course, there's still typical issues like the rigid camera, but I'd call a galaxy well-preserved. In many ways, it was the game I was most excited to play as it was the game that had really gotten me into the Mario series, and I still remember my initial encounter just be me playing an in-store demo for an hour. But replaying it after 64 and Sunshine, I think I found myself somewhat rethinking my adoration for it. Like Sunshine, levels are presented more linearly and gated behind other stars with which only a few have secondary hidden stars, some which require Luigi to find, and others that are locked behind Lumas and Star Bits. Only a few actually incentivize exploration. Galaxy and instead opts for a more puzzle and objective oriented design, and through that it brings back the inclusion of power-up transformations, while 64 largely kept these to the wing cap and metal Mario. Galaxy takes it much further, introducing a host of new ones as well like Spring Mario, B Mario, and even Boo Mario, each changing the ways in which he's allowed to travel the stage, compounding upon some challenges both positively like ice skating and negatively by avoiding meteors on honeycombs, lava, or hordes of enemies to light a torch. The game even exploits this through some bosses only being reachable through these new forms, but also specifically designed to deactivate them or ask for more careful consideration of how Mario is being controlled. But those elements extend past even Mario's own moveset, incorporating guiding bubbles with elements like wind, and using the cursor and webs to launch Mario towards an enemy's weak point or new locations. There's such a wide variety of options and ways in which gravity can act upon these unique landscapes that it only makes sense though that Mario himself controls a bit more rigidly, lest players shoot off into some far off galaxy. I think this general linearity makes a lot of sense given the planetary level design. It somewhat even reminds me of Zelda's dungeon structure and likely the basis from which the 3D land and world games derive themselves from, but I think the main middle ground I appreciated more than anything else was a return to a more freeform stage selection. Get enough stars early on and once you unlock a new world, 
world, like 64, you can skip straight to that area's boss, but that may entail engaging with Galaxy's Comet challenges, which typically appear after every ordinary stage and disappear after another's been done. This can make 100%ing a game a bit more of a hassle if you don't recognize it early enough, as you may be forced into replaying a multitude of stages to activate more comets. Some challenges, like Daredevil ones, ask you for no damage runs or perhaps speedrunning a stage, but those can come off as easy recycling. I probably lost less lives here than any other Mario game, even Galaxy 2, so while they're welcome additions in that they ask for more player efficiency, the caveat of often removing enemies or putting you right at the boss does severely undermine that efficiency. However, they might have even inspired other players to take up speedrunning, so I'd consider them an overall win. I think if there's one thing Galaxy stands to gain more than any other Mario though, it's general level flow. By making each planet's challenges so distinct, it's able to build them into their environmental level design. But because they're so segmented, it's able to swap them in and out at will, letting designers better control and optimize pacing, difficulty, and spectacle. Despite this, Galaxy does have its more modular elements, but it's far more better utilized than Sunshine Steel Cages by being offset via a greater degree of variety and generally fitting into the planet-oriented aesthetic more. Perhaps this move towards more objective-based design like 64's Bowser stages and 2D Mario's is what would ultimately lead towards Galaxy 2 largely abandoning Mario's hub worlds for a standard level select, as it speeds up the downtime between levels and provides a higher engagement ratio than any of its predecessors and, debatably, its successors. This is one of those things that's harder to accept, though. Peach's Castle, Delfino Plaza, the Observatory, they're all great ways to convey information and immerse the player in that game's world, while giving them a sort of training grounds for Mario's ability, which seem to have been made less physics-driven as time goes on. But while these large hubs do well in incentivizing exploration with sometimes rewarding and other times disappointing experiences, perhaps for some they're more hassle than they're worth, especially when you're constantly running from level to level to activate comets or simply get missing stars. Now it's all just a few clicks away. I think if there's one thing though I've come away from the 3D collection with, it's an oddly better appreciation for Mario Odyssey. Yeah, we're just gonna skip over uh, 3D worlds and land because those, while 3D, do take more platforming cues from the 2D cues. And maybe I just wanna talk about that in its own video why, like, let's just go back to Odyssey. Mind you, I should preface this, these are very sporadic and loose thoughts for a game I haven't played in nearly three years outside recording footage for this video. But 64 was a clear inspiration as it returns to sandbox style levels benefiting from a more seamless system, allowing for quick moon acquisition through a means that once more allows players to closer play to their skill level, with Cappy making it possible to even skip large chunks of the standard path all the way to the boss. This would be meaningless, of course, if the stages themselves weren't built to accommodate Mario's wider means of traversal, but at times this can leave some form of wanting. Because players can now just head from moon to moon without restarting a level, there's a perception that less of the stage is being engaged with towards another's acquisition, thus diminished returns. This can be attributed in part to how many of Odyssey's moons feel isolated and easy from one another, especially when the next moon only asks for a simple ground pound or mere puzzle with nothing else to prop it up. 64 4 had its share of these in Lethal Lava Land, but those like Battlefield often made sure the challenge took up a great deal of stage space. Had 64 had seamless star gathering, this perception might change, but that's not the reality of its design, so it had to make sure the intro of each stage was as non-intrusive as possible. Perhaps it's because of Odyssey's seamlessness that moons are so spread out and abundant, and while exploration now plays a heavier role than more defined stage structure, it can, at times, feel no different from collectibles in other games, where awareness is heavier in determining progress. Finish a challenge like the RC car and you're unlikely to ever engage with it again, especially given its short length, and that it doesn't build into other moons, turning that location into a permanent vacancy. Something odd for a Mario game, but I suppose this problem only exists if you're the type to shoot for 100% completion and have little intent to replay the whole game. Perhaps in efforts to alleviate this, then, it adds more moons based on narrative progress and unlocking silver blocks, which can do well in changing how you approach once familiar aspects of a level. It's so multifaceted in this regard that it shows great attention and care into getting the most out of its stage design, but at times it can feel like it hinders the devs from creating more unique and interesting challenges. But in keeping with 64's design, there are more linear challenges present 
meant to accommodate for this, yet despite efforts to make the game more seamless, these challenges remain segregated from the core levels, in many ways more so than 64's, but the flexibility offered in stage design remains worth it. I think a lot of praise should go to the ways in which Cappy's integrated with an Odyssey. He expands Mario's moveset quite a bit, like the Flood, while allowing devs to create more unique micro-challenges that benefit some stages pacing a great deal, and while I think it acts somewhat as a crutch for harder challenges, the way it's integrated appeals to me more than in Sunshine as Cappy better meshes with Mario's core moveset from 64 and Galaxy than the Flood, which was the end goal of jumping, but rarely the lead-in. This opens up a great deal of power to not just speedrunners, but players in general. Getting somewhere you thought the devs had never intended to be reached only to find a pile of gold coins and weight is a great moment, and with no preconception of moon counts or their challenges, it breaks prior Mario constraints by opening your mind up to the possibilities of where other moons might be hidden. It's a fantastic moment. And while it at times does bring with it more engaging puzzles, it's unfortunate that it never pushes this to its max potential. I'm not asking for Kaizo tier difficulty, but it's a shame the general difficulty in Odyssey is such a step down from its predecessors. Even in its penultimate level, it fails to offer much challenge. Perhaps this is great for casual fans and those probably taking a ride to work or on break, but this may also not bode well for those taking it in via longer sittings at home. Grand Moons could have incentivized the creation of harder challenges with their own number needed to advance, it would have helped push exploration, but perhaps funneled players too much towards a playstyle they'd prefer they build themselves into first. And given they'd be irrelevant come the post game, I can see why, even since 64, Nintendo's preferred to keep all collectibles at an equal value. Needless to say, I'm still sorting out my thoughts on Odyssey, so to avoid a lengthy Anderson-style diatribe, I'll stop by saying, while it tries to do more than 64, and though it doesn't always stick the landing, as of now, I still think Odyssey is a good game, but one that needs a sequel to perfect its formula. It already has some of the best spectacle and bosses in the series, perhaps even the best, and with the 3D World Switch release on the horizon, the urge and incentive to return to it is already building. If you've got any opinions on why you'd like or dislike Odyssey, I'd like to hear them in the comments because it could possibly help sort out my own opinions on this, given how much it fluctuates, but I'm just like dropping this right now because I, I really don't know what else to say about it. 64, at least for me, still has the best combination of flow with agency. Even with its sandbox nature, it still funneled players through an upward spiral into more linear challenges, and while it may not have exploited this to the same degrees as its younger brothers, it went a long way to enhancing the experience. Overall, I think despite the disparity between the games and the collection, it was a journey well worth returning to. 64 remains a game with relatively great level design, and while not every challenge is as successful as others, it's a title well worth its reverence. Sunshine makes a great first impression, but remains glitchy and unfinished with great movement and untapped potential, leading to later stages containing lackluster level design. But while Galaxy's linearity might result in others' playthroughs amounting to borderline the same experience, it's a fun ride regardless. Plenty of other platformers and action games do much the same with their level design, but remain great in spite of that. Yet Galaxy's flavor is so distinct, even the slightest of similarities can draw heavy comparisons. While the collection itself may be lackluster in contents, Nintendo's aims to exploit nostalgia have largely worked on me. I think I easily side with most that Galaxy 2 should have been included, or at least the collection been made something more enticing, but this isn't a video about that. Others can easily say more with less time than I, so I won't bother saying much about it here. I still have a Wii U setup, so it's not like this entire catalog is out of my reach. But that can't be said for others looking to use this as a means to be introduced or to introduce others to the series. Not a lot of people share that privilege. Mario's 35 after all. He's come a long way and further still to go. It'd be a shame to leave parts of that past so far out of reach.